Yeah. Yeah, thank you. It's really nice to be here. I love this venue with those like turning auditoriums. It's really cool. So um, yeah, I'm going to tell you something about um, building a software business and um, maybe just yeah to start with some background about myself. You might know me from Spacey, um, which is an open source library for natural language processing in Python. So if you have lots of text, you want to analyze something in text, you want to train a system to do something really custom on your text, then you might be using Spacey. And um, so in 2016, we founded our first company uh, together with my co-founder, Matt, who also just gave a talk earlier over there. And we really decided to bootstrap the company, be self-funded, and we did what we, we call, we raised the client round. So we did some consulting um, to start the company, to get some money in, and then eventually, in December last year, we launched our first commercial tool, Prodigy, and um, yeah, it's, a, it's an annotation tool for data scientists, so basically it helps you label your data, try out new approaches quickly, and um, really you know, iterate quicker on your data, on your code with a model in the loop. And that's um, you know, a downloadable tool we're selling and we're offering, and that puts us here, so that's, that's where we are right now. And Prodigy, since the launch, has been going very well. We have um, a few thousand users now from Fortune 500 companies, um, freelancers, data scientists, researchers, and um, in fact, it's been going so well that we're currently working on an extension product which will have um, a small service layer um, to really help people scale up their projects, um, get more out of their data, uh, manage annotators. So that's what we're currently doing. And in the long term, we're also planning um, a data store where you can then get pre-trained models for custom domains. Say you're doing finance in Chinese, you're doing social media in Spanish, you'll be able to download a model, tune it, tweak it, um, add some more examples, and really build a system that's super, super custom to your own use case. And um, yeah, when we started the company, we really, um, yeah, we, we made the con conscious decision to stay independent, um, to be self-funded, and that's worked very well. Um, we still own 100% of the company. Um, we were able, you know, we, it gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, we're much better off in our positions than we were if we just had jobs. So um, it was a, since this was such a conscious decision, it also meant that we basically had to ignore a lot of the typical things people tell you about how to start up a company. So, um, for example, people often are very confused or surprised that it's basically it's possible to make money and it's possible to be profitable. Or we're still a very small team. It's mostly me and my co-founder. We're working with one developer on the Prodigy extension. We have some cool collaborations coming up. But really, the core of it is a very, very small team. And it also, you know, we can, people are sometimes surprised that, you know, we really put Prodigy on a, an online shop for sale. And you can buy it. And it's yours. You download it like, a bit like pre-cloud Adobe. And you have it. And it's just a simple tool that people like that you can use. It doesn't do anything sneaky. In, it doesn't even go online. It's just a thing, and that's kind of the core of our company. And um, we think that actually, you know, a lot of, so in this talk, you know, I'm not gonna tell you um, how to run a business. I'm not gonna you know, tell you to follow your dreams and do it exactly the way we did. But um, I do wanna share some, some of the lessons we learned, some of the insights we got, and um, just, yeah, some of the stuff we picked up along the way, including, or actually most importantly, some of the misconceptions that maybe some people have about um, uh, running a business or actually even selling software. And, I feel like it starts with this one, which you know, to me is actually yeah, a very important one that we often hear. It's that basically, you need to, if you want to run a business, you need to run at a loss. So essentially, you need to spend more money than you make. Or you even need to you know, take money that's not yours um, and then um, take, you know, spend it, spend it, spend it until you can eventually make a profit. And um, the thing is, you know, there's, there's a reason why um, this is a popular concept and why this works for some company. For example, you know, I'm not saying um, you shouldn't be doing that. There are plenty of business models where this actually really makes a lot of sense. So here are just you know, here are some reasons and um, some company logos that are probably rec very recognizable. So we have one thing, okay, if you need the network effect. So Facebook, there's not really um, a place for a really small social network with 100 happy customers. Like you need, you know, Facebook works because everyone's on Facebook. Similarly, Dropbox or Slack only work if everyone's using it and if you really have the vi viral adoption of the product. So that means, okay, you first need to spend before you can make money or probably Facebook, nobody will ever pay for a Facebook account and that's fine. That's just the type of um, business model. Similarly, you, if you need to scale, you really need to um, invest a lot upfront in your infrastructure. Like a service like Twilio needs to serve their APIs. Um, 
Amazon, Facebook, a lot of these, actually Dropbox, a lot of these are very resource intensive and um, you need to set that up. Once you get your users, your users need to be able to upload um, at one terabyte of data and you need to be able to handle that. So that, that costs money and that, that's an upfront cost. And actually, um, yeah, I included this startup Casper in there, which is the, a company that sells mattresses. And um, you know, they also, they took some funding, they built their mattresses, and then in the first, I think in the first month of operations or sales, they actually got almost half of that back because people bought these mattresses. But they still, they needed some money to um, engineer those and to produce them. And another one is, um, well, the, uh, competing on price super aggressively, like Uber and Amazon are the prime examples of that. You need money and you need to subsidize the difference. Um, otherwise, um, you know, nobody's gonna use your service, and it really just works if you can um, really compete, and that needs money. Or if you, um, as another alternative, if you're going for enterprise sales, um, yes, you need to invest a lot because you can, before you can really get those really large enterprise deals, like Salesforce or even Zendesk. That's what is, um, you know, they're really going for, and here, um, you know, it needs, it needs the upfront investment. You have to accept that maybe in the beginning you're not necessarily going to make a loss, uh, make a profit, and that you're mostly going to be making a loss until eventually, like Amazon, um, you'll be very successful and making tons of money, and your CEO is going to be the richest person in the world. And, but the thing is, you know, the um, bigger, just the bigger company in general isn't necessarily better because software is actually software is actually kind of interesting here because unlike a lot of other traditional manufacturing um, products. Um, it actually gets more expensive to build at scale, not less. So, um, you know, if you're building car parts, cool, you can start building a few, but that's actually much more expensive than if you buy wholesale, you have your own manufacturing pipeline, build a huge, um, like, build a huge company, build a huge, like, um, factory where you assemble those, and then you'll be able to compete on price. If you, um, you know, if you, if you just build a few um, artisanal car parts, um, you're probably going to be outcompeted by someone else. Now, that's not the case for software. Actually, software usually gets much more expensive once you scale up and make it big. And another thing we've seen in um, the companies I showed you earlier, um, most of these are actually in businesses where the, there's only one winner. There's only one Amazon. Amazon can only work if there's one Amazon. Uber, yeah, they, they still have competition. There's local taxi companies, there's Lyft. But the end game is certainly we want to be the only Uber and we want to be the only um, private um, modern taxi provider in um, any large city. So. Um, those are all these really winner-takes-all industries. But actually, most businesses are not like that. In most industries, you can perfectly coexist, and um, man, there's not necessarily one winner. And actually, being in this winner-takes-all market really sucks because, yeah, you can be super successful, you can make lots of money, you can do everything right, and if someone else is like one tiny fraction better than you, you're going to lose, and you're going to lose everything because you're not going to win. And um, often, even maybe for reasons that are absolutely beyond your control, Someone's going to win, everyone else is going to lose. So this is actually, this is not, not even that much fun. And so you've probably, you've probably all seen, yeah, some of you might know this, um, this comic or this cartoon. Um, it's basically illustrating the concept of survivorship bias. So um, the person on stage with lots of money says, oh, never stop buying lottery tickets, no matter what anyone tells you. I failed again and again, but I never gave up. I took extra jobs and put the money into tickets. And here I am, proof that if you put in time, um, it pays off. Well, yeah, it's of course, um, it's true, but um, you're obviously not seeing all the other people who did exactly the same thing and failed. And it also shows that, well, what you see as best practices um, that you've learned, that, you know, we may be adopting from companies um, and businesses in those winner takes all market are all things we kind of have to take with a grain of salt, because do we really know what caused them to win? We don't really, it's just like, you know, we just have one winner, so this is, um, um, you know, this is something we have to consider, and but it also means, you know, if some, somehow as humans, or a lot of people are very much drawn to these tournaments and winner-takes-all markets, and it's kind of ironic because it, if you think about the tech industry, it's all like, you know, it's often we're all kind of nerds who would have maybe in back in school have rolled their eyes at like the kid who wanted to become a pro football player because it's such a ridiculous goal, and you, of course, you're not going to make it, and. Um, but he probably you're going to get injured anyways and you can't do it and it's such a, you know, you should rather go into business and do something real and at the same time, here we are in tech and a lot of people, you know, then go aggressively for winner-takes-all markets and, um, you know, the tournaments where you have to win or not. But the good news is if, if, if a lot of people are doing that, that actually leaves many other high-value opportunities and things untouched. 
and you know, high, I mean actually high value. Like you have to consider if you if you in if you're taking part in a tournament, you need to you know you can't deliver on a few million. You deliver you have to deliver on the billion dollar promise, and that means that you know you can there's so many sensible nice businesses you can pursue that are absolutely um, you know sane, um, very profitable, but that nobody else touches because they're just not part of the tournament. So. Um, um, yeah, this, this opens up all kinds of opportunities in software, and um, it also means that, you know, if in general, you go and optimize for um, the median outcome, which means, and not the mean outcome. So you don't look at, like, oh, what's theoretically um, the, uh, the most, um, the best possible outcome, which is you're going to be the most successful company in the world, and you're going to be the richest person in the world, and instead say, okay, what's kind of the most reasonable, um, high-value opportunity um, where I could make the most um, money out of on average, um, the advantage is that actually, you know, you're going to, um, um, you know, you, you will definitely end up with something at the end, um, even if um, you don't succeed as wildly as maybe you dream. But, of course, it still means um, if you, you know, if you're going for these opportunities, you, somebody, of course, needs to do this. And you often can't do it all by yourself, which leads me to the next misconception, which is you need to hire lots of people. You start a company, someone needs to build it, you just need... Um, lots of people, and um, and the thing is, um, as I said earlier, you know, people are often surprised that um, we still um, we have a very small team. We're doing lots of stuff, but the team itself is very small. And we once had um, a, cu a customer um, send us an email and inquire whether our company would pass the bus test because that's an important requirement. Otherwise, they would have to reconsider doing business with us. And in case you haven't heard of the bus test, it's this kind of thought experiment of what would happen if four people in your company were run over by a bus tomorrow? Would you still be functioning? And of course, in our case, the answer is no. We'd be like minus um, yeah. <laughs> something like no. That's um, of course, of course, it's not going to happen. Um, and also, what he chose, it's it's a very the customer ended up um, buying Prodigy anyways. And apparently, you know, we must have um, still been convincing enough even without the bus test. But um, it still shows like the perceptions people have and also how people view a stable company and what really makes a product good. And it's interesting because if, you've, if you haven't thought of this before, you'd probably be very surprised how um, small the teams are that develop the software you use every day, from open source to closed source to anything really. Often the core developers and the core authors are one or two people. Maybe you have up to five people, but it's just because Google releases some new amazing technology, it doesn't mean that all of Google uh, worked on that. Sure, it was made possible by Google being a very large organization, but the teams themselves are very small. Maybe you have five people who really did all the core work on a thing. So, and this also really shows that, you know, the difference, there's authorship and there's just, in general, the company. And authorship really needs a very, very small team because it's like, I mean, try, try co-writing a novel with 20 people. That's a really interesting art project, but, like, that's not going to be very efficient. Just similarly, try writing a function in Python with five people. How do you do that? Does everyone write a line? Do you like, you know, talk, sit together in a meeting, talk about it? Oh, let's put like, how, how are we calling this variable? Oh no, I would call it something else. No, of course, one person writes it, other people can test it. Um, in, in essence, you need a very small um, team um, making the decisions and really writing the thing. And also, as we all know, it's not that difficult um, fundamentally to write um, software. It's um, you know, you can write a function, and then the refinement process, that's, uh, you know, what takes, maybe takes more time. And similarly, a lot of people argue, oh, well, but yeah, sure, okay, if you know what you want to build, small teams all make sense, but um, you need to know what you want to build first, so you need to build lots of things. So, um, you know, you need to, if you have, you have 10 teams, and you all build something, and then maybe you find the one thing that's good. And, um, but essentially, you know, if you, if you are building the right stuff, that obviously matters a lot more than, like, building lots. So, um, yeah, if you know what you, you want to build, if you really go for that, um, that's much more valuable than um, scaling it up before you even have the first thing that works. But now the question is, well, how does that, how does that work in practice? How do people assemble their teams? And here, um, these illustrations show two very common methods um, that people use to build their software teams. So the one more traditional one is the specialist. So you have several people, everyone has a deeper skill. You have someone who does front end, you have someone who does back end, you have someone who does DevOps. And then you have, and, and those people all work together um, and form the team, so you have all, all the things you need covered. And this works great, but of course there's some weaknesses, which um, is that A, the people don't really understand 
um, necessarily understand what the other person is working on. So you actually have to invest a lot in making the collaboration work. You have to have lots of meetings. Everyone has to always share what they're working on so you can move forward. Similarly, if you have one person who does DevOps and that person is sick, well, then you don't have DevOps. So that's, um, so there's always, there's several problems here. So a lot of companies, even larger ones, have moved over to um, a more modern approach, which is um, the generalist. So here you have people, and they all um, have skills in um, different areas, and they all kind of have the same skills. So this is very similar to a full stack developer, even though we're still not fully sure what that even means, but you can at least define some stack and say, I want developers who can do that stack. And here you have the advantage that everyone can work together much better because they understand the three levels. If you have you know, someone who can do database stuff and back end, and they, everyone knows that, you can you know, collaborate much better. And um, similarly, you can, um, if one person gets sick, leaves, great, um, you, can, um, you can replace them, and you can also hire much better. You have your uh, template of What's, um, what engineer do I need? What person do I need? You can have your book of interview questions and you know if they pass that, that's a full stack developer and that's a person I wanna hire. Um, but one thing that's missing here again is, well, you don't really have any deep specialization. You don't have any experts. Everyone's kind of doing the same thing. And so a third kind of um, you know, alternative model is this idea of the complementary skill. So um, everyone here you see has like um, some deep um, foundation of skills, but they also have other ones. They have kind of this very unique personal blend of skills. And um, yeah, that's something that's actually incredibly diff like, difficult to achieve for larger teams. And it's not that it's like impractical. You see companies do, trying to do a lot with like setting up their labs, trying to hire like really high profile developers who have that sort of profile to really get their thing moving forward. But it's, it's difficult because um, you know, you don't have the same like predictability you have with a generalist. But this is a really, really unique opportunity you can use if you're a small company, because you can just have a few of, um, a few of those complementary people um, with very different skills, different specializations, and, that, and you, know, you have some overlap in them, and that can really move you forward. And that's something you can't necessarily do if you just well, take um, advice from how very large companies are doing it. And really what these, these type of skills come, come down to is this idea of what usually is called T-shaped skills. Because, so you have like this kind of base and then you have like the, the arms for the t-shirt. But um, I like to think of it more as tree-shaped skills because tree is really, you have a solid stem and then you have you know, a few different branches of different, um, different thicknesses and different, um, you know, you, um, you can also have like two trees that kind of overlap. And the other nice thing is a t-shirt is pretty static. Um, if, if anything, it can only like, I don't know, get worse. Um, a, tree is, a tree is alive and a tree, you know, lives, the tree can grow, so you can even, if needed, you can grow more skills and, um, you know, really develop in your um, career. And actually, yeah, I think we, we're quite a good example of this, I would say, because, um, yeah, in my case, I've, yeah, I'm a software developer, but always, I've always kind of made websites as a teenager. I also happen to, uh, yeah, my degree includes, mar um, includes um, media, but also linguistics, so um, I've worked in marketing and sales, but I've kind of come back to you know, software development, and similarly, yeah, my co-founder Matt, he's, um, he used to be a researcher, an academic, mostly specializing in computer science, so that's a good stem there. But then, um, you know, he also happened to um, become an expert in writing super fast Python code. And recently, we had kind of had a gap in DevOps, um, and so he kind of, yeah, happened to grow some skills in that direction as well, which we can use. So now, we have that covered as well. And um, it really, I think th this type of personality profile, that's not, this is not, I don't think, I don't believe this is a personality trait. I think most of us actually have this and um, are those types of people. It's just that in a lot of very traditional environments, this is selected against and this is also not really encouraged because well, it doesn't really make you fit well into any of those predefined roles. But once you, once you leave that idea and once you, you know, move out of that perception, you actually, well, you can, you can build a really, um, good team this way, and you can really have a good, um, um, yeah, you can cover everything you need with very few people, and um, also without requiring um, running at a loss, because, yeah, you need such a large um, team. And the only thing is, okay, so now you have, you have your team um, of uh, tree-shaped people, You've, um, you have something you want to build, you're like, cool, I don't need to run at a loss, I actually, you know, I can sell something. But, 
how do I make any decisions, really? Someone needs to make decisions, and that leads me to the next misconception, which is you can't make good decisions without testing all of your assumptions. And I would say, you know, if you look at this first, it does, it, the sentence itself does sound kind of reasonable. Like, it doesn't, it does, it doesn't sound as, like, um, you know, outlandish as maybe some of the other misconceptions, but I do think there are some problems with this kind of idea, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, and what, one good way of looking at this is um, looking at how people assess failure when, like, you know, a startup fails. So here's a typical thing of someone um, that someone would say um, after, yeah, they think didn't work out, which is, turned out nobody wanted our product. I wish we'd spent more time validating our ideas. Ah, next time I'll definitely, you know, do the whole thing fully data-driven. I'll collect evidence on everything, so I'm not making that mistake again. And if we think back to that little comic about the survivorship bias, this is actually, it's an interesting inverse of that kind of concept, because it also says, well, we didn't do X and we failed, and therefore we conclude that X would have saved us. And that's, um, that's, a very, yeah, that's a very interesting assessment, because in reality, well, do we really, do we really know that? And here's, here's, because here's some stats based on, um, this is a great website called um, Autopsy.io, and they collect um, startup autopsies. So basically, if a, yeah, a company fails, um, they collect what went wrong, and um, they also compile like, interesting analytics. So this one is um, reason startup fail based on 300 of those autopsies. And it might be important to note that these are actually, these, these, they only collect autopsies of startups that actually failed, as in they closed their doors, shut down, stopped. It doesn't include any startups who went on their amazing journey, which is also not necessarily um, a sign of great success. But so this is really just the actual failures. And you see what people are saying. Um, because another thing important to note, this is based on people's assessment, like the people running the companies. This is not like some... Um, objective analysis of what happened. So people say, well, not the right team, wrong business model, product not a hit, no market need, and outcompeted. And this, to me, this kind of shows that actually people don't really have a good sense for what's going wrong or how to even assess that or analyze that. I don't even really fully get the difference of wrong business model, product not a hit, no market need, kind of all the same thing, not the right team. Maybe you thought you needed another engineer. Maybe you were actually an idiot and all your team hated you and that was the problem. Like, who knows? This is, you know, it's really not that um, conclusive. And, but still, what people um, take away from this is like, oh, we need to just test more. We need to validate more. Even if we think something is right, what if we're wrong? Let's A, B test all the things. And of course, I'm not saying that testing things is bad. Like, yeah, we, we publish Spacey. We believe that it's absolutely important to do a rigorous evaluation of how our stuff performs, how our stuff works, and how accurate it is. We're not just saying, oh, well, we put in a lot of effort when you wrote the code, um, looks good, feels good, so must be good. We don't need any numbers. Of course not. But you can easily fall into this trap where you're really trying to validate even things you already know, because maybe it could be that, well, what if you're missing something? What if you think the sky is blue, but actually it's green? Like, this could be, you know, groundbreaking. So, and a lot of this comes from the tournament mentality. If you're taking part in a tournament, well, what you need is you need that one thing nobody else has thought of, because that's going to make you win. So, um, it makes sense. But, it, but if you're not taking in, part in a tournament, do you really need that? But not sure. So, here's, here's a more real-life um, example of this. So, we have employee, cat. Um, looked at a company Twitter, cringed, was like, oh my god, really embarrassing, we look like, we look super clueless, we're just like retreating random crap five times a day, god, can we stop this? And business cat's like, well, do you have any numbers to back that up? Why do you think that? And, like, well, no, but, you know, without numbers, how do you know you're right? Well, by thinking, you know, it looks, it looks really bad. And, you know, I'm sure you could pull up for both positions, you could pull up some study that showed, oh, you have to have high engagement on Twitter because other, you know, you need to tweet five times a day. Retweets are especially good to drive engagement and sales. And on the other hand, well, of course, you can look at something and be like, oh, this looks embarrassing. This is really bad. We probably um, should stop this. And um, what, now, what we can take, take away from this is, well, there is always, you know, there's always a value in, like, just actually reasoning about things. And the decisions we make are based on reason. And if, you run a, if we run a business, we need to be making lots of decisions all the time, all day. And it's not just one decision. We constantly need to decide. And we win if we're right, and we lose if we're wrong. It's, yeah, it sounds simple, but it, 
Well, it actually it is. Like if you you know if you if you need to make you know you need to decide something and you need to be right. And the more right you are, the um, like faster you're gonna move forward. And that's that's also why there's nothing wrong with building things that you think are good. It sounds yeah it sounds like such terrible such a terrible idea. Oh, what if I think it's good and everyone else hates it? Well. You, then there will likely be a lot of other problems down the line that um, will also not help you succeed. So there's, you, know, you can't really make up for a lack of insight and reasoning by A-B testing things to death, and especially assuming that, well, you're, you're running a company, you know, you know things about what you're doing. You're not going to go there and say, well, I have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm absolutely clueless, I don't know, I'm just going to try everything and wait till something sticks. You could, but it's probably, it'd probably be a very bad idea. So, you know, if you really say, well, that's something I think is good, and you go for that, there's really, um, you know, if, if that succeeds, that's a good sign. If that already fails, well, likely you would have probably made a lot uh, more decisions down the line that were equally as bad um, that would have still caused you to fail. And so, actually, right, let's, so basically, okay, so now we assume we have our company, we're like, oh, let's like not waste time on... Um, Let's not waste time on A-B testing everything to death and um, uh, optimizing for some perfect outcome of something we don't even have. Um, we have a, a team of tree-shaped skills. Um, we're ready to make a profit. And so what are we actually um, making money off? And what are we actually selling? And so here, this is something that's, especially in our industry, this is um, really one of the, to me, one of the absolute biggest misconceptions that are really puzzling and that are really lead to very, very weird outcomes, which is, People seem to believe, well, the true value, whatever you're building, the true value lies in your user's data. And the true value, um, yeah, data is the new oil. Whoever came up with that bullshit, that's kind of what drives that. And um, as an example, here's like just a little screenshot from our tool that we're selling, Prodigy. And basically, you know, the idea is you buy it, you pay us once, you download it, you get a lifetime license, and then it's yours. It doesn't connect to the internet, just runs on your machine. And, um, you know, developers, developers really like that. People are like, great, it doesn't try to trick me, I can just use it, and it just works. But when we started this, a lot of people were like, oh my god, you people are so naive and stupid, you're leaving so much money on the table. Like, imagine if you could just track whatever your users are doing, why do you not give them an interface to upload their data, and then you can keep it, and then you can have it, and everything they label, you could have and train one AI model that can rule them all. And because, you, you know, you have to consider what people are doing there is, for example, a financial company wants to analyze um, company reports better, so they'll label whatever occurs there, but the real, the absolute highest value companies get out of the technology is the really, really deep specialization. So yeah, you can have, you can train something generic that just finds people in text, but what really makes a difference is if you can make it find very exact categories in your super specific text. So what people, if people are successful, what they'll be doing here is so specific that it's absolutely um, useless to us. And in general, people tend to very much overestimate um, the value may of label data, maybe because label data is often very painful. And um, in reality, okay, if we, were, you know, if, if we were going to do this and if we needed label data, well, we could just do it ourselves, right? We, we happen to have this super efficient annotation tool, which also we happen to have built. Um, and so, you know, I think we'd be quite effective at just doing it ourselves in, instead of trying to engineer a product in a way that um, basically... Um, yeah, takes our users' data so we can do something with it in the future. And again, this all really comes back down to that idea of taking part in a tournament. Because you know, if you if you need have a lot of upfront costs, you need to raise money. You obviously don't have a product yet, and that's fine. We've seen plenty of companies where you know that has to be the case. Like you're building a social network. Of course, you don't yet have a social network. Otherwise, you wouldn't be raising money to build it. So. You need to sell the potential of your application. You need to sell something that's in the future, and you need to present that. And um, that's more important than the reality, obviously, because you need to convince someone to give you money, and that's fine. But all of this changes if you're not actually taking part in the tournament. If you don't care about this, well, that all, you, know, you actually only have to think about what you can really charge people for money, money for right now. And that's clearly not the data, because nobody yet cares about data. You're hoping data is the new oil, and at some point people will. But actually, in reality, it's, also, it's, only, it's only useful in cases um, like, for example, Facebook. Facebook's data is nice, because they have everyone on the thing. Um, for your random application, not, not necessarily. So you know, there's, it's really not worth, like the idea of adding other random objectives um, to really make, essentially make your product worse. Um, is really, um, 
yeah, kind of defeats the purpose, and it's kind of, it's a bit like, you know, these, um, these superhero comics um, where they, I don't know, you have this super villain who engineers a teleporter or time travel machine and then uses that to rob banks. And you're like, what the fuck, dude? You could just, I don't know, imagine selling the, your time machine. How, how much money could you make? Or charge people money to use your time machine. That's like so great. No, you do something really stupid with it. And that's, that's really, that's, I, I would say that's actually quite a similar idea. You have a great product. Instead of selling it, you're like, oh, no, I'll give it away for free so that at some point I can get, maybe get something out of it that I can then sell. And so instead, I think what really... You know, what, what really makes the, the whole thing um, you know, work is well, people, people like stuff that works. People like value. And people, contrary to what people are going to tell you, people, companies don't mind paying for things. In fact, like, they actually like to pay for stuff that works. They like to pay for stuff that's theirs and that they can um, keep and um, you know, own. And so instead of monetizing something abstract that you came up with, you know, there's, there's money right there. There's a product right there. There's really something there that you can monetize. And um, also, you know, your users, they're not, your users are not interchangeable test subjects that you can like A-B test stuff on. They're like actual, they're actual people. So it's like, you know, if you're running a restaurant, cool, you can test on your um, friends at home and you have crazy ideas, but you have, to, you have to be able to cook if you're the chef and you have to you know, know what people want to eat. Like you can't say, hey, let's, once people come in, you can't be like, oh, let's, let's test and sell everything for super cheap. And now next week, say, let's try how high we can go with our price before people leave. And like, oh, how spicy can we make this dish before someone complains? It's like by, after the third week, you won't have any people anymore. And um, if you're actually selling something, um, you know, people, there's, there's not an infinite supply of people you can A-B test your software on, on and you know, they're real. And, and they have money and they want to buy things and you can just give them things. And the bottom line is, you know, people have come up with so many ways of measuring how successful you are. Engagement, like, okay, we've seen revenue is really good if you're optimizing for that first. And, ooh, you have all these great graphs and you still don't know what you're doing. But actually, there's a really, really simple, really straightforward um, way that you can measure how successful you are, and that's called profit. And if you make profit, it's very, it can be harsh because it's very difficult to lie to yourself um, if you're looking at your profit. Because if you're not making profit, you're not making profit. But it also means that, you know, the, and after, like the bottom line is that you really, if, okay, you're making profit, you're looking at the profit, you can tell how well you're doing, and one big advantage profit has over engagement, over revenue, over anything else, it's yours, it's money, it pays your bills, and you can keep it afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ines. I think that was a really great keynote, was it? Thank you. And you, as audience, you know the drill. There are two microphones. You come now, come ask your question. Question approaching. We have, we have time for maybe like four to five questions. So, oh, some people have to queue up. Hi. Um, hey. This was lovely um, and you. seems like a dream. And I'm sorry to be the pessimist or realist yeah. in this. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe like work-life balance or uh, like it seems wonderful to have I mean, the most three like brightest friends coming together, but something has to give, you know, that um, you have three, which two wins out. Can you talk a little bit more about um, that? Yeah, so I, th I think it's definitely, it's an important consideration. I'm not gonna, you know, I would never defend this idea of like, oh, you just have to sacrifice, like, oh, th this guy never sees his family, but look, he's successful. So um, I do think that's, I, but I do think that actually, you know, this is something that's, that does become easier if you're actually able to, um, you know, engineer sort of your own business model and, um, you know, have a very direct way of selling something. Uh, for money. You have a product. The great way about a product is that ideally, if you're doing a good job, it's done. So that's something that we basically at least aspire to, that we say, we want to build something once, and then it's there, and then we sell it. And we fix a few small things. We, of course, have to talk to people, but the idea is always to ship something that's complete. And that basically, for us, it makes it much easier to um, you know, have a more natural um, you know, kind of timeline of this. We know we're not going to be chained to this for the rest of our lives, and it's like going to be really um, you know, terrible 
till we have something and we can resell it and it still provides value to people. So of course, if it works, that's definitely something we want to we optimize for. Um, and also, of course, I think um, I have to say, well, of course, we, we choose to live in a place um, that's also more affordable than if we lived in the Bay Area, for example. That's an important consideration. And I also want to say this because no, it's bullshit. Like, oh, quit your job and do whatever. No, don't if you, you know, if you, you need money. <laughs> but um, I do think, you know, you can, like, at least, you know, it's, it's definitely something we're hoping to, you know, engineer towards. And that also helps having a, you know, smaller team, a smaller scale, um, very low overhead costs, which means you can, I can say, cool, I'll take the weekend off. And that's, that's it. And that's how can, I can live my life because I'm not dependent on, you know, all this really one big project that I have to do and otherwise everything falls apart. But of course, it's all, you know, um, it's a valid consideration. And I do say I work, I work a lot, but also because it's something I enjoy. So it is very difficult for me to really draw the line there. But I am very conscious and I would stop if it was, if it got like out of hand. Daniel. Um, thanks. That was really interesting. I'd like to ask if so many uh, companies and individuals uh, in this sector are currently chasing this ideology, this dominant paradigm that you so tactfully described as a bit bullshitty. Um, does that leave more room for the people who are following the kind of principles that you advocate, or do you think it perhaps corrupts the entire marketplace and spoils things for everyone? I mean, that's an, that's an interesting question. I mean, the, like. The bullshit definitely, you know, corrupts a lot because I feel like actually it um, sells people false promises and it actually keeps people from maybe pursuing things that actually they would be very successful in and drives them towards other things that um, do not work as well. But I do think actually the fact that people are chasing these really large opportunities in a very specific sector and in a very specific um, segment and in very specific business types does leave a lot of room um, for companies that maybe back in the day would have been filled by a lot of other um, uh, companies and that are now kind of up for grabs because it's too low and it's too small and it's not worth it. So I see this as a big opportunity, even though, of course, everything sucks and everything's terrible. And like, you know, I agree with that. But like, if there's some opportunity there and some hope, then to me it's that. Um, would you say that Explosion AI is a startup or a small business or is there no difference? Um, I mean, I would sometimes maybe, I wouldn't correct you if you refer to it as a startup because that's just what people um, you know, think of. But actually, we see ourselves, what we aspire to is um, this idea um, that you know, in German we call um, the Deutscher Mittelstand, so like you know, middle class businesses. Germany is kind of famous for that, actually. You know, UK as well, at least before Thatcher. So you know, this, that's, a really, that's, and that's a concept that like, really has proven itself um, to be you know, very <laughs> successful. And... Um, um, you know, you basically, middle, so Mittelstand, the idea here is, okay, you have a solid middle class company, it's founded by people um, who, you know, often, maybe sometimes run by families even over generations, and um, you have, uh, it's solid, it makes a profit, it often, often also provides um, things and technology and um, manufactures things that are um, part of a much larger pipeline, like one specific machine to put one car part together, that's like super... Um, popular in like Germany and that's maybe a company you haven't heard of but it's a company that's doing very well and that's that's how where we see ourselves just more um, you know in a modern tech machine learning sector okay so uh, the model for like the small team with a complementary and diverse skills you've been saying about like I think that that's great for a small company with like people with incentive and kind of like senior people with a lot of drive, but do you think there's a place for like junior developers in that, that can only be like, they can do like one thing pretty productively, I guess? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I think the whole ju junior developer idea is also very much shaped by the more traditional specialist, generalist idea. So I, I actually, I'm not even sure in such a, you know, in, in that kind of, but um, let's say hmm. you just get somebody who's like fresh out of university and doesn't and simply doesn't have a lot of experience with different stuff. So yeah, but I mean, often sure, but often you know they do know stuff. They can do stuff if they want to do the job. There's actually a lot more you can you know you can use that probably would get lost in a more traditional environment. And I think there's actually there's a lot of space for learning new things because you know there are all these different areas that you can go into that maybe nobody else has claimed. Um, so 
Sure, but of course, in the founding team, if you want to run a company, build the product, of course, ideally, it should be, you know, you pick something that you know that you're good at, that you can build, and then later you can get more people in who can, you know, learn a bit, maybe bring in their other expertise, um, then learn a bit more about what you're doing. So I don't, I don't think one thing really excludes the other, but I also have to say I don't have, like, much experience with, like, hiring lots of what is considered junior developers and seeing where that goes, so you'd have to drive. Okay, thanks. Okay, now last question this comes from Antonio. So, great talk. I didn't take thanks. my laptop out, so it was very good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I want to play a bit the devil's advocate over here. So, it's like, you showed us a lot of examples of companies that have been successful. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I would say optimizing on loss for the first years. And uh, you showed only your uh, company, Explosion AI, yeah. as uh, a company that succeeded instead of using profit as KPI and all the other stuff. So, how do I know this is not survivor's bias again? Um, well, sure, you don't. You don't hear about, you know, other, the people who've tried exactly our model. Um, that's a good point. And um, they're not standing here giving a keynote today. So um, that's true. But I think it's also if you actually look at the way the economy generally functions, right? And also, even if you don't, if you're not um, self-employed, you work for a company, there's a very clear exchange of value there. You do something, someone else says, cool, you're good, I pay you money for it. That's a much more natural flow of things. And also to, you know, and we've seen this in the past to replicate that. That's a very straightforward model that like, usually you know, doesn't necessarily fail. Um, but once it gets more speculative and weird, then you know, all of that changes. But the sim simple thing of you have something, I want that, I give you money for it, you give me what you have, I think that's a pretty solid model that's like, proven to be successful if you can do it right and have something that people want to give you money for. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ines. Yeah, thank you.